Rafael with NBA Draft Junkies. I have another special guest today. I'm excited about this interview. Um, this is a player that I've had a chance to watch a couple of times. The first time I saw him play was in 2018 in Los Angeles at the Basketball Without Borders. And also, I want to thank the person that set up this interview. It's Kuze Kilic. And Kuze has been a great contributor to the site so far. So. Kuze, you can go ahead and introduce yourself and then introduce uh, your guest. Uh, hello, my name is Kuze Kılıç. I am chef editor at Zero Sport Turkey and also I am contributor for NBA Draft Junkies. Uh, we have a special guest uh, from Spain. Uh, actually, he's Latvian, but he play for Spain. Uh, Arthur Crooks. Uh, how are you, Crooks? Welcome. Hello, everybody. I'm great. I'm excited for this interview. The first question I wanted to ask you is now that the season is over, how are you preparing for the NBA draft? Uh, at the moment, at the end of the Spanish championship, I took uh, two weeks off, like 10, 10, 13 days. And right now I know that I need to get back to work. So I started from this Monday. So it's 13 of uh, July. I started again to work out and uh, I will I think this, this summer I will take more care of my uh, physical preparation. So we're going to work on details what I need to get to get done to, to perform better during the season. Now, do you think you have an advantage? Because, you know, a lot of guys aren't playing and they haven't played a game since March. And so do you think you have an advantage simply because you've been able to play, you've been playing even in practice at, at a high level? Uh, I think... Uh, Probably it is advantage, but I'm the one of the guys who thinks uh, if if you want to, you can find a way. You know how to get better in any aspects. You have so everybody has so many aspects where he can get better. It can be even just as watching the film, you know, and getting better in your head. But uh, from the playing playing stuff, for sure, it was advantage for me to keep uh, to keep feeling the rhythm, you know, of the game, to not lose the feeling of the game. So for sure, that was advantage in this in this case. Your team coach uh, Dushka Unovic was not very good career in Turkey but was Baskonya uh, he is the champion uh, what would you say about his coaching philosophy uh, he's a tough coach uh, he really asks a lot he wants us uh, to give full of our energy what we got and uh, he's really I think defensive coach he focused so much on the defensive side of the game and I think the guys who we had in this team and the Spanish basketball, it fits him great, I think, because uh, Spanish basketball is focused so much on defense. So probably maybe that was the key. All right. Um, I, I think the Spanish ACB is probably the toughest domestic league in Europe. Can you give your thoughts on playing against some of the best players in Europe in the league? I mean, uh, it's always exciting, you know. I was always... Uh, the guy who wants to play against uh, guys who are higher level, level than you and when you get this chance you know to play against this kind of guys it's just huge motivation and uh, excitement for these games so when you get to the court you just feel so much energy you know you don't think about anything else just to show to help the team you know and to show what you got so your family has an opportunity to be one of the rare families that has multiple players in the nba how has your older brother helped you prepare for NBA lifestyle? Uh, how is he helping you right now? Or how has he helped you now or, or just helped you overall? I mean, from the childhood, I think. Um, he's always, like, taking care of me, you know. He always tries to call me to ask how I'm doing, you know. And uh, after some games, usually it's just uh, positive uh, support, you know. He always says me the good things, you know, because we have our grandfather or coach from the childhood uh, who gives the bad stuff, you know, who says the, the bad things we could uh, improve. So, you know, I think it's important the brother support, you know, the positive side of basketball that keeps you mentally healthy. And that's one of the aspects where my brother helps me. Uh, how did you start basketball? And after that, uh, how did you decide to make it as a profession? Uh, I think we didn't really have a chance to choose because all our family from my mother's family side are basketball players and I think we couldn't have chance to choose so we started to, to practice from an early age like six years old you know but not just practice with a group of kids you know we were going individually to do some extra stuff and we gotta you know we gotta start to love this game because we know we're gonna spend a lot of hours in gym. 
it's it's paid off. I mean, if just think, there's only like 450 NBA players in the world, and there's a chance, like I said earlier, your family has an opportunity to have two. So, whatever your family has did or whatever program that they had you guys on, it's definitely working. Which kind of leads to my next question. So, Latvia mm -hmm. is a small country. There's less than two million people there, but it's developing a reputation as a strong basketball country. Can you describe the basketball scene in Latvia? I've, I've had a chance to watch Latvia games from the, uh, I think last summer at the under eight, eight no, was it under 18s? Or was it under 20? Last summer. 18, Last right? summer was uh, under 18, yeah. So I had a chance to go there in Greece and I saw that Latvia had a crowd. You know, the fans came out and supported. And then I was actually at the game. And it's probably one of the best games I've ever seen in my life. I was actually at the game in Istanbul during Eurobasket when uh, Latvia played, uh, they played uh, Slovenia. And just seeing the crowd and, and how the fans came out to support is obviously a big basketball country. So. If you can describe just like the overall basketball scene in Latvia, uh, I think at the moment, uh, you know, the the program of like developing the basketball in Latvia, it's uh, it's like going with a huge steps in front. I think every year we are progressing. We are getting more and more good players, you know, on the world level, and uh, now it's becoming uh, not just number one sport in Latvia. But it's becoming like a culture, you know. It's uh, it's pretty similar like uh, Lithuania has, you know. They know that basketball is number one, and everybody in the world knows this is a basketball country. So I think we are going towards this side, and you know, I think that's going to be the next step. But the world going to know that it's a basketball country. I think that's how it's going, and uh, it became like this because uh, the part, uh, the I don't know how you say it, like you know. The president of basketball uh, basketball league, I don't know, in Latvia, you know, they did a great job, you know, to improve this kind of uh, this side, you know, the of the of the sports, you know, they they really did a great, they did they build the, the gyms, you know, everywhere in Latvia, you know, they give a chance for the kids, you know, to to get out and improve their skills, you know, and just I don't know, just people want to play basketball in Latvia. They just see so many stars, you know, star players. You see Porzingis almost on every second commercial in Latvia on, I don't know, bank credit cards or whatever. And people see the guy with the ball, so they want to know what sport is that. So I think that's the reason. And uh, how is the education and basketball balance of Latvia? Uh, so, uh, as, as I said, you know, we have so many gyms and almost all the schools have uh, basketball gyms, which are in a very, very good, uh, you know, good conditions to practice. So it's pretty easy for the guys to play for their school club, you know, or uh, the club which is next to their school. And it's a uh, very easy accessibility to, to get to your practices. So I think th this is working well. All right, you've been on the, representing the Latvian national team for years. It seems like pretty much your whole life almost. And you had a chance to play at the Eurobasket qualifiers. How was that experience? That was amazing and especially like, uh, Playing that uh, at home, you know, home crowd, it's 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 amazing, you know, and uh, you see your people supporting you and you just want to do the best for your team and for your country at that moment. So that's the only things you think about and the emotions are undescribable. You cannot just describe it, how it feels. It feels amazing. How do you think you guys would compete if you were able to have like a full squad? I don't know. It's, it's hard to say. I don't know. We really never played, you know, with the full squad, but I think if we have it, that will be a world-level team for sure. And who do you think would be the starting five? If you had to make your all Latvian starting five. Uh, point guard would be Strelnix, most probably. Uh, oh, that's tough. Okay, I'm gonna go with, with the positions, I'm sure. So we're gonna put Porzingis as a five. So we put uh, Davis Bertens as a four, stretch shooter. Uh, I would like to put my brother right now, but uh, <laughs> I think I will stay with other guys. Uh, I think as a three, we'll go Yanis Tima. Oh, I like him. Yeah. And as a shooting guard, I think Darius Bertens. So both Bertens in starting five. Who was your favorite player growing up? Uh, like uh, from everybody? Uh, yeah, just overall. I was a big fan of Derrick Rose. Like, if it's just like fun, you know, I liked his game. I took a lot from his game, but 
just like yeah from my childhood it was my player but right now i'm trying to looking for uh, other kind of players to learn okay and who are you watching like today to learn uh, right now i'm focusing more to watch uh, nando de colo i like his scoring abilities you know uh, i think he's a good player to learn from and uh, from nba i really like russell westbrook so i try to you know to combine my basketball iq which would be more like nando de colo you know and try to know how to use my athleticism right watching uh, Russell Westbrook. This season you played with uh, experienced names like Luca Wildos and Tornike Shengelia. What did you learn from them? I mean, uh, from starting with Toko. From Toko, I could I could easily say I'm learning, you know, the warrior abilities, you know, the way he practices, man. He, like, you see, he's... Uh, probably one of the best players in the team but he stays the longest in gym you know I'm a young player I try to be earlier and go out later but Toka will never let you do that you know he just shows like the ambition you know and the character of a real basketball warrior player so I really love that from him and uh, from Vildosa I just like to see him you know because he came here we would say like pretty young you know and he just showed how how you really like everybody can come like a, as a young player to Europe and grow up every year like he's doing huge steps every year you know he just shows you how to get uh, with the great defense you know how to get in the in the team rooster get your minutes and then show yourself on the offensive side so Luke is a great example uh, for the young players for sure now here's a question for you do you see yourself as a point guard combo guard or shooting guard or are you just a basketball moment. player <laughs> I mean, the most important is being on the court in important moments, you know, I don't care which position a team would like me to use, but I think I can help in both ways. I can help in, in a point guard and in the shooting guard, so I would say combo guard. Okay, because I think like when people think of your game, they think of you as a shooter, but I think your playmaking is very underrated. And in your opinion, what do you think is the most underrated part of your game? That's tough to say. I mean, uh, as I as I heard about myself, you know, players think. Uh, uh, I mean, scouts think or teams maybe think that uh, I'm a little like crazy player who can make like you know like several mistakes in a row and maybe cannot control the game, control the pace. But I'm working a lot on this side of the game and the decision making. So I think I will definitely get better next year in that. Well, in my opinion, I, like I said, I've had a chance to watch your game. One of the first things I noticed is that you play with a lot of confidence. And so playing with a lot of confidence means, in my opinion, you're willing to take different risks. You know, like there's certain plays that you will make or shots that you attempt that in some eyes, they may say that's a, a bad shot in a sense, but I think it all boils down to your confidence. I would much rather have a guy that's confident and that's willing to take the big shot as opposed to someone who is scared. That's one of the things, the first things I noticed about your game is how confident you play. I mean, that's definitely true. I really believe the confidence is a huge part of the basketball. I would put it together with the mental stuff. I'm trying to work on that too. You know, I try to watch like some coaches, for example, I really like Tim Grover who was with uh, Michael, working with Michael Jordan. I mean, some of the stuffs I think I would never try to do by myself, you know, but some things you can always, you know, learn and take to your game. So for sure, I, I agree that it's a huge part. What are your favorite offensive and defensive sets like Stinger, uh, catch and shooter role, or for the defense, uh, one on one, uh, two three zone? Uh, on defensive side, I really like to play one on one on ball defense. I love it. I love to challenge myself and I like to learn down, you know, the opponent when he tries to offense and he suffers. That really brings me energy, you know. And uh, on the offensive court, offensive side, I really love the open court game. So I think that would be my favorite parts. Which I think um, why your game should translate to the NBA because the floor is more open, more spread. It's not as physical as Europe. So I think that uh, that actually plays to your advantage. I just, I just want really to say because I'm thinking for myself the same, you know, because the basketball in Europe and in America is different. And I really want myself to try an American style of basketball, you know. I think that could be something new for me too, and uh, I, th I think that could be an advantage because I really love open floor game, you know. Speaking of America, so I was at the game last year where you played against Team USA, and mm -hmm. 
they, I mean, obviously they were more talented and they were able to just kind of like throw a bunch of defenders at you. Um, describe that experience plan and how do you think that you played in that game? Oh yeah, that was amazing experience for sure. I mean, I really loved it, the way they played, you know. I just saw, I, I knew I want to win, you know, and, uh, but when you see the way they play, the way they join the game and they bring this positive energy to the team, it's just, it's just amazing to watch that, you know. But uh, I think it helped me in a lot of aspects, you know, to compare myself, like, to probably future NBA players, you know, to see how ready am I for that level, you know. Even if you know that there is not the top stars of the, of the country, but at least you can see the style of the game, the athletic, you know, level. And I was, see, I was seeing good for myself. That game, I started well. But coach decided to keep me, uh, to keep me, you know, to rest a little for the next games because we knew this game is going to be tough and probably not winning that one. So we needed to focus on the next ones, you know. So I couldn't finish this game and enjoy it as much. But that was one of the games which I would like to play full, full game. You know what? When I was there, I was like, why aren't they? I, I couldn't figure out why weren't you playing? Why weren't you given the opportunity to really just, you know, four quarters to show what you can do? But but now it makes sense. Mm -hmm. Like I mean, story. it was tough for me. It was tough for me to accept that, you know, as a, as a young player, you want to play, you want to try new experiences, you know, and uh, challenge yourself. But I talked to coach after that and we knew that the, we, we're going to play against Canada too as well. So there is another like huge players. And that was the games we really like compete, you know, and uh, that was the games I actually played well. I played my minutes, you know, and I couldn't enjoy myself there. But it was tough for me you not know, to accept that. But coach explained me well everything. Uh, did you get any offers from NCAA? Uh, before I came to Spain, there was some offers. I'm not really sure which which ones will be that. And uh, even when I was here, usually my agent takes care of that. But I just knew that I don't want to go to NCA. I mean, I'm not a big fan of that. From the early beginning, I didn't want. And uh, so I wasn't really interested in listening to which schools were, ca were calling me or whatever, you know, so my agent was taking care of that. When I was younger, I never really looked at uh, American, American basketball. I'm still really far from a college. I mean, I follow right now because so many guys I know they play there and I need to know this kind of stuff. And I'm trying to, you know, improve in this area. But it's just from early beginning, imagine it's a small country, Latvia, small city, which is like 13,000 people, you know, and... Uh, the only things I was watching, it was uh, local games and on TV yearly, you know. So that was the games I was close to. That was the level I knew. And for me, that was my goal. That was my limit, you know, because I, I didn't have this this vision, you know, for myself as a higher level player for that, you know. And when I when I start to improve, when I get to Spain, maybe I start to know more other kind of basketball, you know, in the States, you know, Australia and everything. So now my world is a little more open, you know, for that. But now it's too late. But at that moment, that was that was the, the reason. So what do you think you bring to a team? Like if I'm a general manager of an NBA team and I'm looking to draft you, what do you bring to the table? For sure, it's, it's going to be energy and ambition, you know. And I, I really love to win. It's not just like uh, win the games. I really like to play playoffs and I really like to go all the way to the, to the championship. Like... That's the best. That's my goal from every early season. You know, it's not just to get this win and that win. For me, the main goal from the beginning is to get to playoff and feel this pressure, you know, this uh, crowd all around, you know, the people talking about you as a team, you know, how you get until there. For me, that's the main goal. And I think when I see this goal, like, it's easy, you know, because you can set one, the same goal every season. And you start to work on that. You put one huge goal. And you, you think, you, you know, you, you adjust to every team or every season what you need to give to the team at this moment to get to that. So I think one of my, uh, like, good sides in this case is just I see the same goal as a, as a team, you know, as, as the team managers and, uh, like, club owners or whatever. Because I really like to play playoffs in the, in the final games. Uh, I am curious because uh, you born in Latvia, you grew up in Latvia after uh, you go to Spain and... Right now, you prepare for the NBA drafts. And what are your hobbies? What are you doing in the, your off-court life? Yeah, I mean, I uh, I had one great coach when I was younger in Latvia. Uh, he was in my in my club when I was like 13 years old. He told me a great uh, 
great, you know, scale, like 30, 30, 30. So we say you got to keep it healthy, like 30% physical for the basketball, you know, 30% emotional and 30% mental, you know, like to keep it all the time this way. So I all the time try to listen to my body and charge myself in which uh, area I need to improve. So if I feel I'm tired, I'm going to just, you know, lay down and uh, get get well on my um, emotional side, you know, to, to do some fun stuff, you know. And if I feel like I need something more to do or I feel some pressure, like, I don't know, there's like some more games or uh, some weak sides I need to work on, I go more for the physical stuff, you know. And uh, as I told, the mental side is also very important. When I feel I need to do that, I do that. But my lifestyle is pretty simple, you know. I just wake up, uh, eat breakfast, read some maybe some news, go to practice. It depends on the moment. If it's during the season, uh, I try to find the time for my individual work. But if I feel I'm tired, so I try to keep up the another uh, sectors I told you. So obviously you speak English, and then um, you speak Spanish. Is that correct? Yes. Sir. Okay. So how many languages? How many languages do you speak? Uh, right, right now I speak four fluent languages. Four. Uh, it's a Spanish, uh, English, Latvian, and Russian. I'm impressed. I, you know, I'm American. <laughs> we only speak one language <laughs> and so I, I think for you that it's obviously going to help you out because the adjustment to coming to the states because I, I believe that you are an NBA player and so the adjustment to coming to the states will be easy uh, I know like there has been times where players have come to the U.S. and they know English but they don't understand it fully as far as like all the terminology and the slang so I think that's definitely going to help you out and so for like the the people that are listening in the states that don't understand like basketball overseas or even just life in Europe when did you start learning these multiple languages and did you learn Spanish when you went to Spain and then did you learn English knowing that it was what was needed for you to make it to the NBA Okay, that's actually an interesting question and I have a good answer for that. I was always bad at languages. Like maybe you not believe me, but I was terrible at languages. In school, I was getting, I don't know, like two, you know, not, not positive uh, mark, you know, great. And uh, my grandfather, the basketball coach, he always told me, you're going to need that for sure. Just work on that, work on English, you know, you're going to need it. So they pressed me on the English. Uh, I was all the time, you know, not taking care of that. I didn't understand how important it's going to be. Uh, so, so I got, I got to the Spain without really knowing good English and Spanish zero. So when I got there, I tried to, I, I mean, it just improved by my, by itself, you know, the English, I didn't do anything special. I didn't uh, read anything special books or whatever. I just went naturally talking to other guys because everybody was international talking English to me at the residence we were living in and uh, Spanish, I was doing Spanish class every morning. So two hours from seven to nine Spanish class. Then we go to practice. I didn't go to school. I was doing uh, online school from Latvia. So I had like two, three practices with the gym, you know, so like counting the gym, you know, like three practices a day and with the Spanish classes in the morning. And then you just get used to it, talking to the people all around you. Wow. Like I said, like I, I've lived in China, I've lived in Turkey, and learning another language seems like the most difficult task to me. It just seems like so impossible. So I really like admire guys that can pick up another language. And for you to say that you didn't, you weren't good at languages and you speak four, it just makes you really feel like a slap. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, just life, life, life makes you learn it, you know, it's just life pressing, pressing you. <laughs> so I had to do that. What is your favorite book? Because uh, you say uh, you love to learn, and probably you have a uh, one favorite uh, writer and book. Uh, I mean, there is so many different books. Uh, one is a uh, Latvian. Uh, I don't really know the name, but I read it when I was 15 years old. I remember I was going uh, with the bus to the game. It was a little book, you know, one coach gave me that. I really I swear I don't remember the name. It was just a little story, like kind of motivational book. And uh, we were going with the bus to the game. And that was the moment when I started to understand like how useful are books and how good it can help me, you know. 
and it was funny because the guys were saying yo listen to music to some rap you know get in the zone or whatever and i was reading the book before the game i just found it interesting and it really helped me out and after that i remember uh i got to spain and before i leave i say to my mom nah i read the book this one i'm motivated and i'm gonna buy buy more books and i remember i bring in my backpack like four or five like thick books you know they were like waiting i don't know like 15 kilos maybe together and i was going in airport with a heavy backpack with the books you know with me and uh the favorite book is hard to say but i really love the relentless from tim grover i think yeah i think i think that's uh that's a huge book for a basketball player and who like every athlete you know i think in any sports team can help you to really know your limits and to really know what you can do. That was for sure for basketball number one. And for my outside life, I would choose, I don't know if you heard of Who Moved Your Cheese? I don't know if you heard that book. Yeah. It, okay, so it's just, it just that's the book and uh, the idea of that book is just to adapt to different situations in your life. So I think that really helps me. I have to introduce you to Epe Udo. He's a big, avid reader. He has a book club that he has in the States, and then he had one in Istanbul when he was playing for Fenerbahce. And so I was there, and we had like book clubs. And then he would even like, if it was a book that had a movie to it, he'd have his book club read the book. And then he'd run out of theater, and then they'd watch the movie to the book. He probably reads like two or three books a week. So that's something that uh, that's nice. you guys have in common. For me, it's hard to start to read the book, even I know it's going to be useful for me. It's hard to start, you know, but when you get to start, I like it's hard to stop me to finish that. <laughs> yeah, same for me. Like I used to read often, then I read a, I bought a book maybe like a month ago, and once I start, I can knock out the whole book. I have to make myself stop. Yeah. I can really like knock it out in a day or two. And so yeah. I need to pick up the, the next book that um, well, I need to decide which the next book I want to read. But I, it seems like I'm just short on time because I'm trying to like build my website. I'm trying to do these interviews and and so on. But I do need to take some time out to read because reading just overall expands your knowledge or whatever but I'm such a basketball junkie that only books I read are sports books the last book yeah. that I read was um it slips my mind right now but it's a book about all the guys um, that entered the NBA out of high school and it talks about the good stories you know you, the Kevin Garnett the Kobe Bryant the Mari Stoudemire but it also talks about the guys that fell through the cracks that skip college and they struggle with adjusting to the NBA life so it, it's a pretty good book what's the name of the book uh man i can't think of the name of it right now boys to men what i think what's the name from boys to men that would be nice i mean i have already like line of like five six books i need to read but i will put yours for sure in <laughs> yeah it, it's a good book i mean it uh, just talks about like some of the pre-draft interviews and pre-draft workouts like kobe's and and just oh. everything that they did to try to get him to LA. It talks about Garnett. It just basically just breaks down like all the different stories of these guys who decided to skip college and go straight from high school. Uh, oh. Okay, I found it. It's called Boys Amongst Men. It's by um, uh, Jonathan Abrams. But I'll, I'll send you the picture. You that would be nice. Thank you. I would appreciate that because for me it could be useful right now. So maybe it's going to be the next book I'm going to read right now. Okay. <laughs> All right, well, man, I really, really appreciate you taking your time and coming on this, this podcast. Um, yeah, I can't thank you enough. And I'm looking forward to seeing you in the NBA next season. And so for the people that are listening and that may want to follow you on social media, where can they, where can they find you at? Uh, probably Instagram. That's the most uh, social media I use. Okay. I know I, I know I need to get slowly to the Twitter because all the all the sports world is there, but I need some time because it's hard for me to adjust for that. It's more I think American uh, style, you know. Okay. And what is your Instagram? Uh, like my last name, Kurutz. Dot Junior. Okay. And what made Junior. you come up with that name? I was always wondering. I was always being a little brother of my brother, like the smallest okay. brother, and. Uh, like all the world was calling me like a small kurutz, you know, and uh, I just got to it, you know. I never took it uh, on the bed bedside, you know. I always like smile on that, and uh, that was that was easy. I I chose it when I was 14 years old, and it just stays there. I stuck with it. All right. Yeah. Well, thanks again, man. Like I said, I appreciate you thank coming you. on. Hopefully, thank we so can much. stay in touch. Oh, thank you so much. All right. Cool. Thank you. So, thank you, guys.
All right, thanks again. Thank you for everybody that is tuning in and listening to NBA Draft Junkies, whether you're listening on Spotify or Apple or you're watching on YouTube. Thank you very much, and we're out of here.